much for uh, hosting what promises to be a fascinating event uh, and also for uh, inviting me today. Um, massive thank yous to the Energy Systems Catapult. I think many people in the room, but not so many outside, uh, know what an amazing job uh, this organisation is doing. And its uh, presence is uh, enhanced by Guy Newey, uh, one of our former advisors, who I like to think brought much of the brain and quite a lot of the brawn to energy policy decision-making uh, in Bayes over the last few years. But it's really great to see the talent that is in the Catapult. And, and frankly, Frankly, thank you very much for allowing me to come and uh, take a moment out of uh, some pretty hairy short-termism that's going on in Parliament <laughs> and perhaps focus on some of the things that I'm really passionate about, you know, I don't know, saving the planet, how do we transition the heating system away from high carbon choices, so it's a really great opportunity for me to be here. And of course, as you all know, this is a massively important uh, conversation. As we said in the Clean Growth Strategy, as we've said for many years, you know, heat is a massive part of the emissions problem. Uh, if we're going to hit our 2050 targets, we have to uh, grapple with uh, many of the challenges as you know where, where we start from and actually come up with a whole mix of policies and uh, procedures as to how we're going to go forward and we've gathered an enormous amount of evidence on options for heat decarbonisation through the programme through the catapult through a lot of the local work that's going on um, but for us it's really uh, I think a time to pull those findings together start making some decisions and start moving forward and a couple of things. I mean, you will know if you've heard me speak, I'm a great believer in you kind of, you start with, you know, you are where you are. You start with what you've got rather than how you would like the world to be. It's a, a bit like, I don't know, supporting the Prime Minister's deal, let's say. Uh, but, uh, you know, and the point of this, and that's the last Brexit reference, I promise. <laughs> the, the point of this is we are a highly centralised, gas-based heating system. We know how difficult it is to persuade consumers to understand the challenges. We know how people think about upgrading their homes and when they do. Uh, we know about the enormous cost of the installed base and so starting from those principles and working out how we can move forward I think is hugely important. The other thing as Phil said is it's absolutely got to be a whole of government approach. Um, I can take no credit or, or maybe just a little bit of credit for uh, the Chancellor's uh, green spring statement but it was remarkable because for the first time we are setting out some really clearly uh, ambitious policies about how we move forward. Government is there to set ambition, to provide incentives, to provide regulation as we did successfully in this space with the move to, uh, to condensing boilers, but to actually be delivering what we set out in the Clean Growth Strategy, which is a firm commitment to having no new build reliant on fossil fuel heatings when we have alternatives in the system, and actually using uh, the power of what is a very large government policy, which is to build millions of high-quality homes that are affordable to buy and affordable to run, is a way of really stimulating that market, driving prices down, driving innovation up. So it's a very much a whole-of-government commitment. Um, I don't want to, I know there's lots to get through, but I wanted to focus on three real challenges today. The first is this whole systems approach to heat decarbonisation. Secondly, the thorny problem of how you develop a, an offer that work, a low carbon offer that works for consumers. And thirdly, the value of localised solutions, the bottom-up approach, because I do also firmly believe that there is no one-size-fits-all, and actually local-based solutions will be hugely important. And if we can keep these priorities at the heart of our policy making, I think we will make uh, enormous progress. Um, so to start with the wider energy system, you will know uh, heat accounts for 45% of energy demand. Any choices we make will therefore have a profound effect on how the wider energy system has to, re has to respond. And I think as Phil referenced, this is in the context of other demands being made on the wider energy system, electrification of transport being, being the obvious one. Um, with large-scale electrification of the heating system, deploying technologies such as heat pumps, demand on the grid will double. Uh, also, if we need uh, low carbon gas uh, to be brought forward using hydrogen or in fact decarbonising gas at source, we know we need to look at massive deployment of technologies uh, like CCUS. And again, we never try to pick one approach, we try to work with the whole system approach and see what are the whole range of solutions. And I think that leads me to, to welcome very much the modelling environment of the catapult, which is a, a, a sort of systems-based approach. It isn't just looking at, let's pick this winner and see what happens. It understands what the various trade-offs are. And the Energy Data Task Force, newly set up, 
uh, working with wonderful people like Laura Sands, is, is trying to help us sharpen up our analysis of that, looking at data flows, including increased digitization uh, of demand, to, to see what will, will impact. So, for example, with hybrid heating systems using gas and electricity, digital service can, services can continually oscillate between choices of fuel sources at every moment to minimize emissions, cost, or demand. And we're continuing to fund research to on this basis of optionality to see what else we need to bring into the system. Um, high for heat, you know what you will know about, is seeking to understand more about how we deploy uh, hydrogen at a consumer level. And we're well into the second phase of the £20 million industrial fuel switching competition, seeking to stimulate early investments in industry, helping to them to move away from, from fossil fuel heating. And in fact, I had a brilliant meeting yesterday in a slightly broader uh, conversation with uh, some of the airlines talking about their fuels from waste program and what they need to really get that moving. So this is all terribly complicated from a systems basis, but being able to parse it up and have good data is clearly a huge part of the solution. And of course, it gets to the second problem, which is consumer choices and behavior. You know, we all again sit around in theory and say, well, why don't people invest in these low carbon solutions? Whether it's, you know, as so simple as insulating their boilers or investing in a, a more efficient, uh, uh, sorry, insulating their roofs or investing in a more efficient gas boiler. And of course, we know that those choices are, are really difficult for people to make. Um, with low carbon heating infrastructure, again, those choices will get even amplified. New boilers, new meters, new insulation, an entirely new heating system. When do people make those choices? Generally, when they're moving in. Uh, lots of policy options out there being floated, things like stamp duty changes, uh, a revival of the Green Deal. These are all very good ideas, but trying to make that actually deliver uh, is a huge challenge. But of course, again, relying on the uh, Energy Technology Technologies Institute work, we know that there is a precedent that says people are willing to embrace the change when they see the benefits. Um, I grew up in the 1960s. I still remember not having central heating, the excitement of pressing uh, patterns on the frost inside the window. I mean, it, I, I grew up in a you know nice house in the south of England. This wasn't some sort of uh, you know this was normal in the 1970s. But we saw that the adoption of central heating rose from 25% in, in uh, 1970 to 90% in 2006, despite often enormous disruption caused by its installation. And this, of course, came about because central heating offered tangible household improvements. You could heat your home, whole home to new levels of comfort. And so if we want to stimulate a take-up of low-carbon heating solutions, trying to uh, sell those, low, those carbon benefits, those low-carbon benefits to consumers uh, has to be part of it. And we therefore have to understand more about how people use heat in their homes and how digital uh, solutions actually interplay with that, again, as being, as, as being explored in the program. Um, and we also need to make it something that is just business as usual. And again, that's why I was so pleased at the spring statement, just added in low carbon heating systems as a standard for our future building programs going forward. But we're not doing a great job on some of this. The public attitudes tracker uh, we run at the moment says that 10, less than 10% of the public are familiar with renewable heating technologies. Now, again, part of the challenge is we have a highly fragmented advisory and installation system. You tend to think about your boilers and your central heating once or twice in your life in a, in a particular house and you rely on whoever comes around to do it. So how do we train the installers? How do we get those, uh, th th that understanding up there? And so we have commissioned research into how we actually do engage consumers, how we work with the installation workforces, and we will be publishing, as you know, our roadmap for heat policy uh, ne early next year, and part of that will be based on these choices. But of course, there are places around the country, our four nations, who are, are already delivering. We have got some fantastic local uh, action programs out there, again, funded, through, funded and supported through the research programs and the catapults. And we, the Energy Paths Network model that was developed through the Smart Hist Systems and Heat Programme is looking at many of these factors. We've got local energy plans from Manchester, Bridgend and Newcastle that set out tailored options to deliver heat. Now, um, is Richard Young here? who I came from Bridgend, is he coming later? 
Uh, so I, who's been replaced, well, <laughs> I hope that's not as a result. I hope that's not as a result of a by-election. He's being, <laughs> Minister, he's being replaced Hello. by one of his team. Oh, marvellous. Year. Well, I greatly <laughs> enjoyed my visit to Bridgham when we saw the Salsa House and looked actually at what was an amazing work that was happening there, amazing uh, leading work, also looking at um, using mine water heating solutions, something that I think is of great interest right across, right across the UK. In Manchester, anyone who's here from Manchester? Ray! Uh, many smaller flats and apartments looking at what you might do with electric heating, actually, you know, moving back to electric heating, thinking how that might be deployed. And in Newcastle, who's here from uh, Bonnie Toon? There we go. And uh, lower housing density, larger, harder to heat homes, using an option of decarbonised gas uh, look to be more effective. So there's really good kind of living labs actually operating in people's homes happening right across the UK. And the Prospering from Energy Revolution programme again, the catapults playing a central role, will deliver these demonstrators and a dozen local systems designed to show how these systems might work. And of course, you will have seen that I put £8 million into funding local energy hubs to build this capacity out in the local networks uh, and also pulled the community, uh, rural community energy fund out of the well, to call it the cold dead hand of DEFRA is unfair because Michael Gove is an innovator, but I felt it sat much more sensibly alongside the other uh, energy programmes we're delivering and from constituencies like mine, which has 42,000 homes off the gas grid, looking for innovation in that space is absolutely hugely important. So I don't need to tell this room about the challenges. Um, what I need to do is uh, provide a huge, you know, please go further and faster, both in gather gathering the evidence base but helping us make really good policy choices. You'll be familiar, I'm sure, uh, with the uh, Secretaries of State's uh, four principles for the energy system, and it's really worth a read because it sets out you know, questions about optionality, no regrets, how we actually move forward. Um, but fundamentally, we need to be pragmatic in how we approach these solutions. We have got the solutions out there, working to deliver them at the lowest possible cost and the maximum possible impact. Uh, is how we will deliver this. Now, we will pull all of this together into this roadmap. I know sometimes people think that's an exercise in paper pushing. It's actually an incredibly helpful way of setting out the priorities. The clean growth strategy has been enormously valuable as a prioritization document, and we want the heat uh, decarbonization roadmap to do the same. But we will uh, accelerate attempts to deliver these no regrets policy options to keep this moving along. As you saw, an increase in the proportion of green gas in the grid, uh, consultations on how we phase out the installation of high carbon fossil fuel heatings, uh, relying on regulation and, and legislation if we need to do that, continuing the funding for RHI out to 2021, and continuing to see how we can accelerate work on energy efficiency, and in particular addressing uh, those who are at greatest need most. Uh, taking eco, as I've done, and pivoting it entirely to focus on fuel poverty and raising the proportion of eco that is spent on innovation, which is already starting to deliver some great results. An example of think of how if we focus our firepower, we can actually make a real progress. Um, so I've overrun, but I want to finish by thanking you all very much for what you're doing. Thank the Catapult uh, for continuing to lead the charge on this, and I'm really looking forward uh, to focusing on these long-term solutions uh, once we get through the short-termism that is uh, engaging many of us at the moment. Thank you very much.